Welcome, everyone. I'm Jonathan Reckford, CEO of Habitat for Humanity International. Thank you for joining us today. I've been so looking forward to this conversation, which is one of many we've been having about the importance of housing, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm a huge sports fan. In fact, when I've spoken to student groups about following your passion, I've had to qualify that popular advice. Had I followed my personal passion, I would have attempted a basketball career. We won't talk about all the reasons why that didn't happen, but I'm grateful that I can pursue another passion, which is to serve. Our guest athletes grew up in Habitat homes and will share their stories of what stable housing meant in their lives. First, I'd like to introduce A.D. Franch, a member of the U.S. women's national soccer team, which won the 2019 World Cup. She has played with the Portland Thorns since 2016, setting a league record for shutouts in 2017 with 11. Franch earned the honor of NWSL Goalkeeper of the Year for 2017 and 2018, the only player to ever win it twice. AD was supposed to be in Japan with the national team competing on behalf of the United States at the Olympics right now, but with the summer games have been delayed for a year. In talking about the Habitat home she purchased, AD's mother Raquel recalled how important it was to own a home where children can have their own yard to play in and feel safe. The yard is where AD could be outside and play soccer every day. And on her bedroom wall, she hung pictures of soccer greats Mia Hamm and Brianna Scurry. AD is recovering from surgery. We wish her the best in her rehab. We are also honored to have with us today Oklahoma City Thunder forward Isaiah Roby. Growing up in a small town in Illinois required dedication for Isaiah to pursue basketball dreams. He recalls driving 90 minutes round trip both ways just for practice, and that was the AAU practice. But that dedication paid off. Three weeks after moving to Texas upon being drafted by the Dallas Mavericks, Roby joined others from the team to work on a Habitat home in West Dallas. He said for a family to have a home of their own is huge. It's just a totally different situation and environment to come home to your own house. When asked what his mom thought about his working on the Dallas home, Isaiah responded that it's something she expects him to do. We are delighted that he continues to support Habitat's work. Isaiah also went, underwent recent surgery and is recuperating. And from the gridiron, we want to welcome Malcolm Mitchell, former wide receiver of the New England Patriots. In Super Bowl, Super Bowl 51, he grabbed five catches in the second half and collected a championship ring in the victory over our Falcons. I'm an Atlantan. Yes. We are still trying to get over that one here in Atlanta, but we are thrilled, Malcolm, that you could join us. Malcolm tells of sleeping on couches and air mattresses during some difficult years of his childhood before his family moved into their habitat home, a white house with blue shutters and a front door. That door, along with their own mailbox, was very symbolic for Malcolm, as it marked a new beginning. He credits his mom and her deep faith for encouraging him. A strong advocate for youth literacy, his book, The Magician's Hat, helps children discover the magic of reading. Malcolm is the founder and CEO of Share the Magic Foundation. And moderating our discussion today is Maria Taylor, analyst, host, and reporter for ESPN. A native of Alpharetta, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta, Maria played volleyball and basketball for the Bulldogs at the University of Georgia. She was named to the All-SEC Volleyball Team three times was also a member of the USA A2 national volleyball team. She has an undergraduate degree in broadcast news and received her MBA from Georgia. Thank you, Maria, for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Jonathan. for joining us today. Just one plug, we're gonna have an opportunity at the end of this program for you to ask your own questions. So feel free to put your questions in the chat box. And with that, I'm gonna hand it to Maria. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's good to see someone down in Atlanta still hanging in there. I just got to New York and I already miss those Southern ties that we have. Um, but that brings up why Habitat for Humanity is so close to my heart. Obviously, it's based in Atlanta. And I've always known the great work that Habitat for Humanity does. Again, over 29 million people have been helped to find shelter and build that foundation that we're going to talk about right here today. And everyone who's sitting here on this call, I'm a personal fan of. As someone who covers sports, they are brilliant, excellent, and have achieved things that I could never dream of in sports. And so I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation. 
And AD, I really want to start with you. And as we talk about sports, obviously there's something that happens when you're younger, in your youth, that inspires you to work as hard as it takes to even be considered making a national team, let alone being prepared to go and play in an Olympics. Uh, but what do you remember about the foundation that was set for you when you found out that your mother had secured a Habitat for Humanity home and what that security meant for you moving forward? You know, as a kid, you don't really realize, um, well, so some do, some don't. They don't realize that there is more um, until it's been, you've been told there's more um, or shown that there's more. And, you know, we bounced around house from, from house to house. And when you have a home that you're able to stay in and constantly be in, you don't worry about where you're going next. Um, you don't worry about the changing potential um, schools or uh, meeting new friends and having to start over. Um, you you find security within that, and um, that lack of or not lack of, but without that worry, it gives you time and less stress and and things that you can really focus in, whether that's school, sports. Um, whatever your skill set is, whatever your hobby may be, um, it allows you to be a kid and allows you to be you without worrying about if I'm going to be staying on, sleeping on a floor or um, having to go somewhere to do my laundry or, you know, these different things that um, the luxuries of having a home bring. And it's just, it's so impactful because those little details make a massive difference. Yeah, and any child that has to go through that, you know, is obviously going to be concerned with just the necessities. I mean, that's the, the base level um, of what a kid would be concerned with. And I read an article, Malcolm, about you, and you talked about sleeping on air mattresses or, or just not really being sure about where you were going to end up. And that all changed. So describe where you were before Habitat for Humanity, your mom applied and it was received, and after. Like, how would you describe those two lives that you, you led? They were completely different. And here's, here's what led up to our interaction with Habitat. My family went through a divorce, uh, which caused a little bouncing around uh, from house to house, from couch to couch, from floor to floor from Air Mattress, and we found a temporary home at my grandmother's house in Valdosta, Georgia. Um, if anyone looks at my life or understands um, sport and how it represents persistence, relentlessness, uh, and just the ability to never give up, I will say that same uh, drive exists within my mother. So even though we were in my grandmother's house, sleeping on, my brother was on the couch, I was on an Air Mattress, we all shared the same room. Uh, my mom applied for Habitat for Humanity in uh, government assistant housing. And I will never forget the night she found out she got denied uh, government assistant housing, public housing. She cried and she wanted to give up. But Habitat called the next day. Mm -hmm. And that house was much more than just a house. It was uh, faith. It was. Uh, it showed me that relentless effort, persistence, uh, leads to good things. Habitat uh, provided hope. It was the first. It was the first yard, first mailbox, first front door, first bedroom. Um, so our life went from uncertainty and dreaming of uh, this uh, miracle to uh, proof that God is real. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because you, we talk about doors and just bricks and all of these materials, but you're talking about a reality where you open a door and you're walking into faith, you're walking into hope, you're walking into a future that in sometimes as both you and AD have described, you couldn't have even imagined or dreamed. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah, I know that for you, you were the first Habitat for Humanity home in your community. So that that is completely different um, than, than maybe even what individuals have found out before because they might have been introduced to Habitat for Humanity or they heard of someone that grew up in a Habitat for Humanity home. So describe what it was like for you when you guys were able to find out that the next phase of life for you included a solid home um, and shelter. 
Uh, I mean, it was amazing. You know, um, my family, we also were living in public housing before we got our Habitat Home for Humanity. Um, you know, I had spent time living with uh, my grandparents, my grandma. Um, I, I spent time living with my aunts and my cousins all in the same house. So, you know, being able to have a place where I can go and I have my own room for the first time, um, you know, that's it was just amazing being able to, you know, put up my, what I wanted on the wall, posters on the wall, whatnot. Um, and also being able to just have a place that I knew was, was my own home. Um, it was amazing. You know, we were able to get, I think like most of my, my best memories are from that house. You know, my first bike, my first, um, my first basketball hoop outside. So, you know, it was just, it was just a place where, um, you know, me and my family felt comfortable. And, you know, like everybody else said, it was a place that inspired hope in, um, in everybody in our family. And in a lot of ways, I'm curious, we can all chime in on this, or I'd love to hear all of you guys' thoughts on this. Where you are almost inspires where you're going. And you guys ended up, you know, being shot out of a cannon. And obviously our athletic success is completely ridiculous. But how do you think even having a Habitat for Humanity home has informed the athlete that you are today, the way that you appreciate things, the way that you think about things, the way that you pay things forward, because you all do. And Isaiah, we can start with you with that question. Yeah, I would definitely say... Um, Kind of like echoing what they were saying earlier, um, you never really know what's possible until you know you get a little taste of it. Like for me, growing up in a house where um, you know we have double the amount of people as we do rooms in the house, you know that was normal. Um, you know I never really um, until I got it, I never realized like man, having my own space is, is pretty cool. It's pretty you know it makes it easier for me to, to you know go through day to day life. Um, but also it makes you very um, like grateful. I think I think the biggest thing that came out of that for me was just being more grateful for for what I did have and um, grateful for the sacrifices people made around me for, to get me to where I was at um, and where I've been able to go in life. So you know, without without that, you know, I would I wouldn't be here. Mm. Ad. You know, my mom um, likes to talk about the yard, um, especially me being a soccer player, being able to take a ball out there and just kick around um, where before um, right outside the house would be the street. So, um, and it would be like a busy street that I wouldn't be able to go kick a ball around. But those, those moments um, are so impactful because I was just able to be a kid. I was able to play with my brother and sister in a space that was safe and that my mom didn't have to continually worry. And me being the oldest, I had that as well with my younger brother and sister, definitely wanting to protect them. Um, and it allowed for us to recognize that time together can be so much more when you have space to appreciate one, of, one another. And then understanding how Habitat works. As a kid, I saw so many different people come and help and support and build my home that almost subconsciously taught me that the people that you surround yourself with help guide you. I, I truly believe that. that. I believe that's my core. And without them, I wouldn't have had that stability to be able to focus as much on my sport without worry. And that allows it to be easier. I love that. Malcolm? I'm going to piggyback off both Isaiah and AD. Uh, I think one of the major things uh, is gratitude and also appreciation for uh, the hard work that took place to, to have that home. I, I think for my personal situation, it was an opportunity for clarity. The environments that we were in prior to Habitat were kind of chaotic. So really didn't give my mother an opportunity to let her voice reign supreme. But once we got into Habitat, a Habitat home, she was able to instill accountability, responsibility, um, taking out the trash, cleaning up your room, all of those intangibles that we don't think of much in our day-to-day -day life, but play a tremendous role in how we operate. Um, saying thank you, um, turning off the TV, going to get your sister for dinner. It's all those little things that we didn't partake in when we didn't have a home. We didn't sit down and have a Sunday dinner. Why? Because we didn't have a table to call our own. Uh, 
Um, we didn't sit down and watch TV because we didn't have a, a couch to call our own. It's all those opportunities that afforded my family an opportunity to mesh, evolve, grow closer, and I think that plays a tremendous role in the life that I'm living today. And what's crazy is that opportunity starts with building the home. Like right. not a lot of kids, they move into a home, but like you guys get to sit up there and say, but no, like I was a part of putting that roof on or this brick here, or we chose a color together. Not a lot of people have that. And you mentioned it, Malcolm, before we all went live, that you felt like that was one of the best parts of the experience. So describe that and tell us why you feel that way. I was the biggest fan of uh, going to the Habitat site and helping put the house together. That was my favorite part. As an athlete, hard work um, and, and doing your part is something I've always believed. And that was an opportunity for me to buy in, um, not just emotionally, but physically and help put together the thing that I would be calling home. It was an extraordinary experience to me. I know for my mom having a home, she has to pay rent, worry about all those things. But being able to say, I helped put that wall up, made that house mean that much more to me. <laughs> yeah. AD, I see you smiling, so I know you have something to add about the build, <laughs> the working hours. <laughs> well, I was like, I was 10, uh, if I remember correctly, when we got the house. And, um, you know, I like to say, I would like to say I helped put that wall up, but I maybe only put a, one nail in, but I can say that I helped build my house. So that's what makes me laugh, as, as Malcolm was saying that. Like, I, I remember doing a couple of little things, but those little things are just so, um, they, they just mean so much to my core. And it, it makes me smile kind of going down memory lane as we, we talk about this. And you know, that's what's so impactful with all of this is it, it creates memories and, um, and, and like, I, I can't stop smiling because it makes me feel, it, it's, it makes me feel so good and just the impact that it has. It's, um, there, there's no really words to describe that. Mm. Isaiah, what do you remember about the construction of your home being prepared to move into it? Yeah, I remember, um, you know, just, just a feeling of, um, uh, it was it kind of just it didn't seem real almost like having the whole community come together um, and work on something that my family would be living in was just amazing. Like, um, you know, we had local churches, we had people um, in my family, outside of my family coming together. And I remember, um, I mean, kind of, you know, obviously I was I think I was about 10 years old at the time. So, you know, I wasn't doing too much as as far as hammering nails in or anything like that. But, um, you know, I would be helping out by handing out donuts to the workers. Um, uh, you know, pouring guys, pouring um, people coffee or, and whatnot, whatever I could do, picking up nails. Um, and it was, it was just, it felt like we were all there for, for one purpose and one mission. And it was, um, you know, it was, just, it was a very special experience. And that's why, you know, I'm looking forward to, to doing, you know, even more of that, um, helping out with other families. So Isaiah and AD, they put one nail in. We got Malcolm maybe put up a wall. <laughs> we, we have different levels of construction uh, from our adolescent habitat for humanity builders here. Um, Isaiah, we, as mentioned, Jonathan mentioned it, that when you were originally drafted, one of the first service projects that you did was in Dallas, and it was building a Habitat for Humanity home, and you and your brothers worked to, to raise money and everything. So how was that full circle? Like, how would you describe being a the part of the community that's helping to build something for someone else, knowing you had been through that yourself? Yeah, it was awesome. Um, I remember the first thing I noticed, like going, going to the uh, construction site was that in Dallas, they had like probably three times as many people as I did in my hometown. And I was like, man, I wish we would have had this many hands. We could have got it done a few months early. But, um, you know, it was it was an amazing thing. I got to go to actually three different houses in one day. Um, they had three different construction sites going all in one day. So I was able to, you know, uh, put some nails in in one house. Uh, another house is almost finished. I was able to paint an, another house. So, um, and meet a bunch of people in the community. And, um, you know, it was great to be able to, to see them and, uh, you know, leave a message with the family that, you know, this is a great, you know, you guys, you guys, this is a great, you know, stepping stone for you guys in your life. And I hope it, you know, I hope it brings you guys um, all types of uh, opportunity and, and just, you know, um, you know, you know, a great, a great time. Mm -hmm. That's a great message to have. I'd love to hear, um, A.D. Malcolm, the message that you have for the kid that's moving into a house or the family that's getting prepared 
to do that or the community that's helping to build a home because these are all things they, they could be encouraged by your message i mean obviously you guys taking part in it taking advantage of the opportunity you're the outcome you're what everyone is donating money for because you guys are just great 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 examples of what can happen so what would be your message to those individuals i would encourage anyone who gets into the process to enjoy it appreciate it and just take full advantage of the opportunity that's presented. I think uh, something that my mom let me know immediately when we got into the house is she said, this is a great opportunity, this is a blessing, this is a miracle. But we have to understand that our work ethic and our pursuit for excellence does not stop here. This is a sign that God is telling us he is here with us. I truly believe that, I feel like Habitat uh, infuse more energy, more hope, more relentlessness into my pursuit of life. And I think it is the starting point to my belief that all things are possible. Um, just because where we are and where that put us. So to sum it up, I would say understand, take full advantage, be, uh, be grateful, be pri take pride in the house, take care of it but understand that your pursuit does not stop there. Mm -hmm. Love it. I, I think for me to uh, the community and the volunteers and everybody who works within Habitat, thank you. Thank you for understanding that people need homes. Kids need homes. And um, some people don't understand that they, the luxuries that they do have are essentials that some don't have. And when you put the time in to help other people, it makes a difference. And, you know, it has made a difference in all of our lives because individuals and groups and communities came together to help us have a home and stability and our families are appreciative. Um, and for the people who are about to have the home or move into their home, um, congratulations, you, you deserve it. I think that's a big one is um, it's not a hand, it's not just charity, it's you put the work in. And that's what people I don't think understand sometimes with Habitat. Um, they see it as we just got a home and um, I had to work, I had to work and buy it for my home. But for people who get Habitat houses, like they actually put the hours, the work to help build it, to get to the point where they can then be stable within this home. And if they don't, make the hours that are required, then unfortunately they don't receive the home if I understand it correctly. All right, that's what I thought as a kid, right? <laughs> but <laughs> it's so important when you receive the keys that you understand that you deserve it and that you are worthy and that your kids are worthy. I would say, um, I like to tell my mom we made it. That was a moment. Um, cause as, as a kid, you know, my goal was to go to a world cup and I called my mom and was like, Hey, we made it. Um, but I also had a moment when we were in front of everybody walking into the home and receiving our keys that mom, you made it. I would agree with Malcolm. You still, you still pursue and keep going, but just enjoy that moment and recognize that that is a very important moment and you deserve it and you made it. Mm. I love the fact that you guys, like the moment for you, AD, that you're deciding, you know, I don't want to go to a World Cup. Like you were probably living in your home then and you were able to like believe that. You mentioned you're playing outside in your backyard. You know, Malcolm goes on to win a Super Bowl and that's, that's probably something he was dreaming up while he was in that Habitat for Humanity home or getting drafted for you, Isaiah. So I'm actually curious, like when you guys were kids and we'll do a little bit of sports as well, like when did you realize all of this was possible? You have your security, you have your home. When did you realize that athletically, the things that you were going to accomplish were also possible? I didn't. Mm. I, I, 
at that time, I, I didn't know. And the more that opportunities um, opened up for me as as I continued to work hard and have that ethic, that work ethic and that drive and determination, which allowed and opened opportunities for me, the more opportunities grew, I almost started going on a path. And then I started to see that things became closer and more achievable and more reality. So you almost put that goal to where it's so far out of reality, um, but you hold on to it for yourself. And then these goals continue to bring you closer to that furthest goal or dream. That's why people say, dream big, because you never know. Dream big. It may not feel possible now when you're 10 years old, but I'm 28 years old. I was, oh, it's possible. 29 years old. I'm here. <laughs> we made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm, Isaiah, what about you guys? <laughs> I would say my vision and dreams for being an athlete started while I was in the Habitat home. I moved in at the beginning of high school, and I became a uh, national recruit, uh, part of the Under Armour All-American. I was recruited by every school in the SEC. I, Nick Saban sat in, my, in our Habitat home. Uh, Mark Rick came and ate dinner in our Habitat home. And so there were a, a lot of um, uh, dreams that became reality uh, in that house. And I'll never forget, uh, I took a, a sheet of paper out of a notebook, and on the back of my door, I nailed the SAT scores that I needed to get into college on that. I, I wish I still had that door, which my mom probably does. But... <laughs> Um, that house played a tremendous role in where I built confidence, where I established my goals and dreams. Now, in that moment, did I realize I'd become a Super Bowl champion? No way. But I, I was hopeful that I'd make something of my life. <laughs> Isaiah? I think you might be muted, Isaiah. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was I was just saying, um, my path was probably more similar to AD's. Um, you know, I kind of I kind of just grew up, and my I, like I always had a support system behind me, whether it was my mom, my dad, or my or my grandma, um, or anybody in my family really. Like I never really thought, um, you know, NBA is is what I'm gonna do. Like uh, I grew up, I played football, basketball, soccer, baseball, um, uh, like everything. I just was an active kid, and I was always pushed to be, you know, to be, to be, to be great, greater than I, I even thought I could be. Um, so, you know, growing up, uh, when I moved into my habits at home, actually, I was, I wanted to play football in college. That was my, that was my dream. Um, and then, you know, a couple of growth spurts later, um, I'm getting, you know, Division One basketball letters in the mail, and, and I started thinking, like, maybe basketball, I can do, I can do basketball, you know. Um, and then I didn't even believe really that um, NBA was a realis realistic thing for me. Um, one, just because where I'm from, I think there's maybe, I think I'm one of three division one players from my town for basketball, um, ever. Um, so NBA seemed, you know, um, you know, way out of, out of the picture. Um, it wasn't even until I was at Nebraska and maybe my second year, one of my teammates said like, you know, you, you can be an NBA player. Like you don't, like you don't realize it, but you can, you can be that. And for me, um, I think my success has just come from me always just, keeping my head down and, and just working. And, um, you know, I think that um, with hard work and, and dedication, you know, anything is possible, you know. Um, so, so that's kind of how I've always looked at it. Yeah, that's an important message for anyone, whether you're getting a Habitat for Humanity home or, you know, you're just working towards the, the dream big goal that AD uh, was talking about. We're going to talk to Jonathan because I, I want to eventually get, you know, like Saban, Mark Rick, maybe we can get everyone to come into a Habitat for Humanity home and like shoot a little commercial. I'm envisioning a recruiting visit in a Habitat for Humanity home at some point. Um, but I also think that, you know, we're all affected by COVID. Obviously, nonprofits play an even bigger role in making sure that people make it out of this season of life um, on a st stable path, I would say. But how has it affected each and every one of you guys? How are you guys handling just the current climate, socially, the pandemic, globally? 
Um, how are you guys staying mentally safe, physically safe right now? So one of the things that I fell in love with while I was in college was reading. And I think self-exploration is one of the most valuable things we could uh, do for ourselves. So COVID has uh, given, given all of us an opportunity to pause, think, uh, recalibrate to say, uh, find new passions, uh, intensify passions for things that we already enjoy. And for me, I have a nonprofit that focuses on youth literacy and introducing books into the homes of children uh, who grew up similar to the way all of us did. Um, so uh, we've taken that virtually and been able to, to get more kids participating and getting them to understand the importance of literacy. Uh, along with the Habitat House, I think, having the ability to read uh, is quite essential to long-term success. So that's what I've been doing. Awesome. What about you, AD? Um, well, for the first three months of this year, I got, I got married in December, and then I was basically gone for three months with the national team, with everything going on, with um, qualifying for the Olympics and um, our own She Believes tournament. And um, so when I got home, it was it was weird um, to be home for a, a long time. At first, it felt um, I felt a little guilty because it felt good to be home um, with everyone dying um, and I've just everything that it has the impact on people. So I felt a little guilty feeling good about being home. But um, it was a time that my wife and I, we spent a lot of time together. I got back on the bike and we were able to do yard work. And that's one of my favorite things, again, like from the Habitat house, once we got the yard, mm -hmm. Like I'm all about a green, nice, beautiful grass out front. And then we have a garden in the back and um, was really able to put the, my time and passion into that um, as we waited for us to be able to start playing again. Um, personally, I've been able to, you know, this is, this is the most I've been able to see my family and friends like since high school probably, um, you know, as, as athletes, college and professional both you know we have very very hard schedules um, when it comes to family and sometimes it can feel like you know we, we kind of lose touch with our friends and family so for me um having my having surgery and then also with covid um it was kind of a blessing in disguise for me to be able to go home see my family see my friends um just work on myself as far as um like Mark was saying reading more um trying to trying to get into new things because you know like this this shows us that anything can happen at any time you know our our, our jobs our our lives can be disrupted so um you know being able to battle that i know a lot of people have been going through some sorts of um whether it be some sort of hardship you know whether it's not knowing where money's coming in now because their job is not you know their job is not paying them right now um whatever it might be you know uh, I've, been, I've been just trying to work on my my mental my mental health and, and then also to spend time with people that I love. Mm -hmm. It's almost like this pandemic or this time has reminded us, us all of how important home is. Like you guys are all individuals that are, we're all used to traveling. I'm the same way. You're used to being on a plane and gone. And there's been something almost refreshing about having to hit pause and, and reevaluate where you are. But the entire point of Habitat for Humanity is building homes. So I'm curious what home means to you. Like right now, how would you describe it? What does it mean to you, Isaiah? Um, home to me, it means uh, it means it means somewhere that you feel safe, um, somewhere that you know that like no matter how bad a day you're having, you can come home and you can whatever you need to do to unwind. Whether it's you know take a long shower. Or, or just talk to your friend, your family, or your friends. Like you have that, you have that safe place, um, and being able to be comfortable in your safe place is, is a huge thing too. Um, you know, now that, you know, growing up how I did, and um, you know, sharing rooms, sharing beds, sometimes even, um, you know, now that I've had that taste of my own space and my own, my own comfortability, you know, that's something that I wish you know everybody could have, everybody could experience. It's a great, it's a great feeling, and um, not to say that you know that. Um, you know, growing up how I did was bad because I think it made me who I am today. And um, that's why I'm so grateful for it now. But, you know, it definitely is, is it's a special thing. I will, uh, I must admit, I haven't felt 
uh, a sense of home since we moved out of that habitat. Mm -hmm. um, I moved out of the house when I went to college. That was almost 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Make me feel old. <laughs> and since, I mean, since that time, you know, I went to the University of Georgia. I was going home periodically. Then my mother moved out of the Habitat home into another home. And, you know, my, my life, kind of like I was saying, has been this constant movement over a course of time. And I think, you know, I'm a new father, so uh, I, I just got into a place. So I'm trying to reestablish what it feels like to have a home. Mm. Yeah, uh, Malcolm, to piggyback off that, like, um, that's what we do as athletes, especially in the business of um, being a professional. You can be traded or, yeah. um, you know, let go at any point. Um, but with constantly, especially with the NWSL, we're for like six months, um, seven months of playing, we, you move into market, you move out of market, you move into market, you move out of market. And so from basically 2013 until um, 2017, I was just moving all over the place, that same kind of feeling as a, as a kid. Um, so it almost that adaptability, um, you kind of forget kind of what home feels like in a way. Mm -hmm. My home was always in between was always to go home to the Habitat house in Kansas. No. And and that's what my mom always wanted for us was for her family to be able to have a home to come back to at any point in their life. Um, and then I, I bought a home two years ago with my wife and it, it almost like reestablishes that feeling um, of having a home and what it means to you know, go with the national team and then, okay, I get to go home. Um, and then it's like, well, what's the difference between the home in Kansas and, and home in Portland is one more of a home. Um, and, and for me, they're both my homes because it's where my heart is. It's where my family is. And, um, I think that's, that's, what's important. Mm -hmm. Well, Jonathan, I know we're going to bring you back in to open questions, but how extraordinary is it that even now where they are now, these Super Bowl champions, Olympians, you know, NFL draftee or NBA draftees, and they're still saying that home to them means the Habitat for Humanity homes that you take leadership over or, you know, that you're designing the programs that you're designing. That's pretty cool. You know, this is uh, this is the fun part for me. There's so much we deal with challenges and the bur the barriers and the things we're trying to break down so that more people can have the opportunity. Um, you know, you you three are all such inspiring examples of why we build. And not every uh, child in a Habitat home gets to reach the pinnacle of athletic success, but but our hope is that every child in a Habitat home gets to grow into all that God intended for her, or for him, and uh, and have those opportunities and to and have that stability. And so it's. You know, I've been reflecting a lot personally in this time of COVID where, you know, I have a job that I can do from home. I have a safe place to live. I have an internet connection. And, you know, to think that a quarter of the world um, lives in slums or in inadequate or unsafe shelter. And so being told to shelter in place, one, if you have no place to go shelter, and two, if sheltering in place means you can't feed your family, um, you know, that just doesn't work. And so I, I feel this impatience and urgency but also a great sense of gratitude and it's um but but thank you all for uh for inspiring well i think we all owe you a a, a huge thank you because it's uh your program and uh, habitat for humanity that afforded us the opportunities to as ad said dream big and i think that was a a beginning step into what we began to perceive as a huge opportunity that we can continue to go on and live. So. Well, thanks, man. And I'm curious from your perspectives, it's so interesting to me that um, when you ask people, and maybe that's starting to change with COVID, but historically when we've asked people what matters most, um, you rarely heard housing. And in terms of priority for people who are the donors, and my hypothesis, and I'd, I'd be interested in your feedback on it, is that so often the decision makers in life are people who all grew up in good housing, which is sort of self-fulfilling. And yet when you talk to somebody who doesn't have adequate housing, um, there's almost, you know, once you have food and water, uh, it is such a, 
a, a basic need. And I think it's where the storytelling is so important, but it is, um, I'd be interested in your perspectives on how to kind of raise the visibility of what it means and how critical it is for children to have a, a safe and, and stable place to live. Well, one of the major things for me, and I, I'm, I'm piggybacking off of maybe all, all of you from our conversation before we went live is exposure. Um, I had no idea the relevance of being a homeowner. A homeowner. I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea what it meant to have your own yard, your own um, mailbox. None of those things really existed within my scope of reality. That's when I began to understand and learn a lot more that took place from being a homeowner. Um, so all to say is exposure, to, the exposure to the reality of having a home in itself allow me to educate myself more on something that plays a tremendous role in our society. Please jump in. I have to ask a sports question too, because I'm a sports fan. How, <laughs> how is it as, you know, as a pro athlete dealing with COVID for separate from the logistics, just how are you thinking, you know, Isaiah and AD about uh, this sort of new strange normal of how to how the, have the leagues operate in uh, in our COVID world. What's it like, the idea of playing without fans? How do you think about some of these uh, these challenges? I think, um, I, I think for, I mean, for, for me personally, our league, um, the NBA has been doing a great job, I think. Um, I think they said they have, you know, zero positive cases down there in the bubble. Um, they let me, I mean, I'm actually staying back in Oklahoma city right now because of my injury and because of my rehab, um, um, just facility wise and time wise, it makes more sense for me to be here. But, um, you know, I'm really grateful that sports are back and, you know, it, it kind of makes everything feel a little bit more normal that sports are back. Um, I know the MLB is, is kind of struggling right now, um, as far as canceling games and whatnot. But, um, I think, I think that it's important to make sure that safety is the number one priority right now. Um, if, if leagues are able to do it safely, I'm, I'm totally for sports coming back. And, um, you know, it definitely is going to take some time to get used to. Like when I first came back from surgery and I was working out here in the facility, um, you know, I was working out with a mask on. It was hard to breathe. Um, you know, you got to take your temperature before you come into the building. Um, we were doing COVID testing weekly. And um, these are all things that are kind of, you know, um, they're obstacles, but I mean, when it comes to safety, they're all important. And um, so, you know, it's definitely gonna take a little bit of time to get used to, but um, I think that people are doing a great job of, of uh, taking the necessary precautions. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, the Portland Thorns, they were in Utah with the NWSL, had the fourth, first uh, sports team back, you know, in the US. <laughs> so I uh, had to, represent there unfortunately I wasn't able to go with the team um because I had surgery but you know everything uh like Isaiah was talking about with with our training sessions we would um do our whereabouts our COVID testing once a week temperature before we even drove to the stadium um you know we go through we have apps that we go through all of our wellness questions um and you know like you said health is the priority and the NWSL did a, a, a good job with the whole month that they had for the tournament. And um, I think it allowed for the NWSL itself to recognize that potentially we could add this tournament. Um, there's talk about adding the tournament within the season um, like they do on the men's side. So it, it's good to see that they can um, have that kind of production with also keeping everyone safe. And, you know, they'll continue to look throughout the rest of the season if there's anything that they can continue to do more games and what that looks like. But, you know, with this COVID, we're recognizing that there are, we are be being forced to think differently and think creatively and um, which allows for more opportunity. No, that's great. Hey, we um, promised the audience we would ask some of their questions. There are a lot of questions. I wanted to make just a, a couple of quick observations from your wonderful feedback. Um, one, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if, if you actually planted the seed, because I am a Malcolm, I'm a Tar Heel, not an Alabama fan, but Nick Saban actually personally sponsors a whole bunch of Habitat houses. And so maybe uh, maybe you were the spark there that uh, even if he didn't get you to play, he got you to uh, 
to think more about it. But I love that challenge. I think every coach ought to, ought to help with that. The other I just want to reinforce, because often this is one of the biggest misconceptions, and, and you all certainly hinted at it, but when um, the biggest misconception of Habitat, other than President Carter starting and running it, which is, is not true, though he is our most famous volunteer by far, is the idea that we give away houses. And, and I just want to reinforce um, that sense of partnership. So to, to purchase a Habitat home, families have to first uh, be low enough income not to be able to qualify for traditional bank mortgage, but then they have to partner. And that means they and their families put in hundreds of hours of what we call sweat equity, helping literally build their home and their neighbor's homes and taking uh, classes in financial management and home maintenance. So they're really well prepared. And that's why our Habitat homeowners have been so successful in their homes. And then the, the critical other piece is demonstrating the ability to pay back a very affordable mortgage and our local chapters then re revolve those funds in the same community. So each family, as they're making their payments, helps the next family have their opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. We are actually being joined by people from all across the United States, including, uh, and the world, including Romania and India, and a lot of hometown fans. So uh, you three, including Portland, Oklahoma City, and Atlanta are here with us as well. Uh, just a, a comment first from uh, Milwaukee Habitat. Uh, AD statement, many kids don't know there's more, referring to kids without permanent homes, really hit me. Thank you for sharing. And uh, first question from Malcolm, couldn't you let Atlanta get their first championship? <laughs> we tried. We gave them a 24-point lead. <laughs> Ouch. That, that really didn't make anyone feel better, I don't think. I'm, we better move on. It is, uh, no, I... My brother is a, a, a huge uh, Falcons fan, and uh, everyone asked when the game came up, would I find any discrepancy in doing my job? Not, and I didn't find any problems whatsoever. <laughs> Evidently not. <laughs> Merciless. <laughs> Question um, for, for any of you, did your family build relationships with staff, volunteers, other Habitat families within the Habitat program that still exist? Did, did have those, some of those relationships endured? I, I know my mom has a friend who, when she went to go pay uh, the mortgage every month, developed a friendship with the um, the lady, uh, one of your female workers that worked at the front desk. They became good friends, started going to church together, and uh, fueling each other's faith. I know um, for me, there's a bunch of people. My mom actually just sent me a. Uh, I kind of was going down memory lane, looking at a bunch of old pictures from the construction. Um, and there's a bunch of people from my community that I honestly didn't even know um, worked on my house. But now that I like I know them now and it's like, oh, that person helped build the home that my family grew up in. So, um, you know, for me, it was really cool to see that. And then also there was I, I forget his name, but he, he was really helpful and, and really um, instrumental in building building the house. Um, he, he just passed this year and I wish I knew his name so I could, you know, um, so I could you know honor him for that. But. Um, you know, there's definitely is just looking back on it. There's so many people that helped and it's, you know, it kind of just gave me, um, you know, another new perspective on, you know, on my community. Yeah. I know my mom definitely, um, made some friends. Like I, I believe the main contractor there for a while. I don't know if they're still in touch today. Um, but some of the volunteers and the biggest for me was, um, my first grade teacher <laughs> was actually a volunteer and, um, oh. You know, she I think she did it uh, a couple times, but the first time she ended up coming on a Saturday, I was I was kind of thrown thrown back a little bit and so excited to see her and gave her a big hug. And um, she brought her her two boys and her husband and they she put them all to work and we probably chatted more than she did some work. But uh, she had them go. And, uh, you know, it's just how small the community is and but how big the impact is. That's beautiful. Thank you. How. uh how for you did your experience with Habitat influence your thoughts about philanthropy and giving back as you've now established yourselves? I think that was for me, um, you know, I, I always knew if I ever got to a platform like this um, where, you know, people look up to me, it's kind of it, it's kind of surreal to me still. Like even at a college level, I would have, you know, I'll be out at dinner with my with my teammates and have a little kid come up and say that, you know, I was their favorite athlete or. I was a role model for them. Um, so, you know, that was always 
uh, a dream of mine to be able to have this platform to to make changes in other people's lives um, in whatever way I could. And I think that I think programs like Habitat for Humanity, um, even things like Shop with the Cop around Christmas time, my family was involved with that when I was a kid. Um, you know, we would get um, the the local police department would send my family a turkey for Thanksgiving. Um, so you know, my family's always gotten help, and I've always looked forward to helping other families. I think Isaiah and AD have said it, and I guess I'll reiterate that it takes a village, and no one ever accomplishes anything on their own. So as I was able to grow and and have certain accomplishments in certain areas of life, it was a necessity to reach back and, and help others as much as I was I was getting help um, throughout my process in which I'm still in a in, in a stage where a countless amount of people are helping me accomplish some goals now that I'm a retired athlete. So starting my foundation was a no brainer for me. If I found a tool that helped me be, become more successful in life, well I am required based on my philosophy of life to pass it to those who also may need it. Yeah, I think that philosophy becomes just ingrained and almost subconscious. I think that's, you know, when we receive that help, um, it's it automatically allows us to um, want to pay it forward. And, and I think that's what's beautiful about community. Thank you. We have a comment. Isaiah, A.D. and Malcolm, thank you for taking the time to share your stories and highlighting how home helped you get where you are. You are all inspirational witnesses and advocates of what is possible. I love that. Uh, we had another question from Charlotte, North Carolina, a, uh, a Georgia fan uh, who would love to hear about the impact that seeing your family put in sweat equity to help build their home had on you. So maybe especially talk about your mom, seeing the, the work they put in both to provide for your family and on top of that, um, help make this all happen. Maria, would you like to go? <laughs> I didn't have to put in any sweat equity. My dad basically built our house by himself. <laughs> but I would love to hear your story, Malcolm, because you put up walls in your house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I grew up in a single parent household and uh, my leader, my uh, provider was my mother. So watching her um, go to school, work, and uh, put in the work necessary to obtain a Habitat house was inspiring, and it, it definitely fueled my understanding of hard work. Uh, I, I remember like it was yesterday, my mom getting the opportunity to apply for a Habitat home, running into the bedroom, pulling out her wallet and cutting up all her credit cards because she says, I have to get my uh, credit score right because we will not be denied this home. Um, I remember her uh, calling her older brothers to come help her as it related to getting the necessary hours. Uh, I remember her being on to my brother and I about helping in any area that we could. So watching my mom put in that sweat equity uh -huh. also transitioned to me understanding the sweat equity that would be necessary to obtaining everything in life. Yeah, my mom is definitely my champion. <laughs> yeah wow um word i mean i don't have the words to describe what my mom means to me honestly um she's made me who i am today because of that sweat e equity that she taught us i mean and malcolm i love that you used sweat equity as like more than just for the habitat house it's what you need period in life um, and I'm going to, I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just that, that constant belief of never giving up, um, because there's definitely hard times and you, you don't have any other choice, but to continue to survive and continue to work and to continue to grind and, um, you know, keep fighting even when you're down because opportunities will come. And yeah, so keep that sweat equity up. That's awesome. 
Yeah, uh, I would, um, you know, I was going to piggyback off of, off of both AD and uh, Malcolm. Um, you know, my mom is probably one of the most hardworking people that I know. Um, actually, not probably. She, she definitely is. She's, she's definitely, um, you know, the most hardworking person I know. Um, you know, my, my parents were married when I was younger. Um, my dad was in the army. We moved around um, from military housing to, you know, to public housing, and then finally to our um, Habitat Home for Humanity. And, you know, like like everybody else's mother, like my mom had to do more than, um, you know, as much as she could. She would pick up side jobs for me to be able to play AAU, you know, um, you know, sports and 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 gear and all that stuff is not cheap. So um, having a, a single parent household, um, you know, she was she had to do more than, you know, the normal normal mom would usually have to do in order for me to, to do these things and to, for me to get to these platforms in order to get to college. Um, in order to be seen by these uh, college coaches. So, um, you know, I think her hard work was always instilled in me. Um, and, you know, I think that she was just a role model for me uh, for my entire life. Uh, you know, that's, she's, she's the main reason why I'm here, where I'm at today. Thank you. We have a million more and we're running out of time, which I hate. Lightning round, final question. <laughs> if you could sum up your Habitat uh, experience in one word, what would that be? Transformational. That's a good one. That's a real good one. <laughs> uh, How are we supposed to follow that? <laughs> you can have the same one. Okay. Um, I'll say um, uplifting. Inspirational. Inspirational. Fantastic. I hate to bring this to a close because I have loved the conversation and I want to thank each one of you. Honestly, you have lifted me up. This has been a tough time for our country and world and you are just such uh, shining lights of why we do this work and, and more of what our world needs. Thanks to each of you for your contribution. Habitat for Humanity has been at work to provide affordable housing solutions around the world for over 40 years now. And we have the privilege of partnering with more than 29 million people to build or improve a place to call home. But we never want to forget that each person, each family who has partnered with Habitat, has a story to tell about building a better life. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and inspiring others to take action in support of safe, decent, and affordable housing. Now more than ever, we need to get people excited about helping to create strong communities in which all residents can thrive. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you all for joining us in the conversation. We look forward to continuing it and let's recommit to a world where every child has a decent place in which to live. Thanks.